So in the last orchestral programming, day two, I said, that was me. I've given you everything I've got. There's nothing more that I know. There is one exception to that, though, and it's the way we can make our orchestral programming sound so much more full of life and realism. That's by using real musicians. We are, after all, writing orchestral music so we can work with orchestral musicians. I want to show you that there is nothing to fear here, just like when we approached orchestral programming in the first place. So I want to take you back to the shed and show you how I prepare for an orchestral session just with one violinist and one cellist, thanks to the powers that be at Spitfire for providing a small budget for me. First thing I need to say is there is absolutely nothing to fear. This is the easy bit and the best bit. Because we've been good girls and boys and have done all of the individual parts, if you recall in day two, we separated the kind of block chords, the compositional loose arrangements we did in day one out into the separate parts. It's all in there, ready for your players to play. So we just need to identify which parts of the sequence we're gonna output as notes on the stave. I don't read music, I can follow a score, and you don't need to read music either. There's just some very basic principles I'm going to take you through alongside some technical preparation tips. The first thing I'm going to do is just going to listen to the track as I left it, day two, and I'm just going to identify the different regions which I'm going to use to create the notation and talk you through maybe some changes I'm going to make to the arrangement now I know what I'm scoring it for. It's your piece of music, you can change it, and you know I'm not working for a director today, so there's a few bits I think I'll go, well, seeing as I've got a live player, may as well use the live player to play this part. So let's have a quick listen. So we start with a staccato or spiccato bit, which I'll get the cellos to play, but then we go to the cor anglais. Which is really beautiful, but seeing as we've got a, a, a live violinist who plays in that kind of register, why don't we make the violinist play that part? So we'll have like a solo violin part at the beginning. So I'm gonna isolate these two, color them, just so I know those are the ones we'll be coming back to to notate. So very easy here, we've got the firsts that we separated out, so we'll be using that, and also cellos, I believe. part here which will be we'll get the violins if they can to play on the top and cellos on the bottom color those <laughs> And that flute part at the end, again, seems we've got a live player, I'm going to vouch for them to play that. So here are the basic regions that we're going to be working with. The next thing to do is to, we don't have a string section, we've just got a violinist and a cello. It's all you need to make this sound even better and real and really connect with you emotionally. Uh, but what I want to do is get up the solo versions, sample versions of the players, so I can get an idea what it's going to sound like and also check for things like they're not going out of their register and that kind of stuff. So let's pull up a cello and a violin. 
Right, so I've got the violin first desk here, and I'm just going to use the longs here. It's going to be very kind of brutal sound. We're never going to hear this. So this is first. Again, going to be really brutal. So then what I'm going to do is this is going to be the violins, definitely. This is going to be the cellos, and this is going to be a mixture of both. So I'm just going to merge these by copying them over here. So that's the cello part, VC, violoncello, and then this is going to be the violin part, there. And I'm going to mute the cor anglais at that part, and I'm also going to mute the piccolo at that bit, uh, because we're no longer, we may, if it doesn't work out with the violinist, we have the choice later to reintroduce the sampled woodwind. I'm just going to make these two regions the same length and here we go into the score. Now I don't want to make this a logic tutorial so I'm going to talk in very loose terms but there are just a few little kind of logic quirks that we'll have to address in order to be able to edit this. So I'm going to make it into page view and we need to get rid of all of these awful pedal, me with my naughty pedals, which in logic we just hit that away they go. Right, so that's kind of ready to work with, but going back a step, the way that logic or sequences interpret what you play and notate them for you is pretty brutal. So it's good to just go in to the MIDI and have a real tidy up. And this is why it's great to have a totally separate kind of notation track, which isn't part of your sequence, because it's likely you're going to move the MIDI around uh, in a way that's not going to sound great, but it's going to look great on the page, if you know what I mean. Right, you'll see it's a bit untidy. Things are overlapping, could appear as chords on the page, and I'm playing ahead of the beat, so you may get these odd timing all of that kind of stuff. So the first thing to do is just make sure everything's strictly quantized. So I'm going to quantize it to eight and then back to sixteenths there. And then I'm going to do a thing called force legato, which is just to make sure the notes butt up against each other. I'm not using this last one here because I do actually want that break there, but I want it to be strictly on the beat, not just after it. And then same with these bad boys. And you'll see that there's three notes there. That's going to be tricky for a violinist to play. They can play two notes or, or you know, they can play four by going across the, you know, the four strings that they have. Um, but the more strings you get to them to play at the same time, the more kind of, I don't know, gypsyish and kind of rough sounding it is. So I'm just going to get them to play the top note there, none of the others. And then again, just make sure none of this stuff overlaps. So again, just goes over a little bit there. That's the first violin tidied. You can imagine with a full kind of score with all of the different voices, all of the different choirs, the orchestra, this is quite a time consuming process. So this is what my orchestrators would do. They spend most of their time just clearing up my mess. So same thing applies here. I'm going to quantize it to eights just to make it kind of quite strict and then interpret it back to sixteens. I think eights probably would have been fine. Okay, so that's all quantized. The violin played the upper part. So we're going to get the cello to play the lower part of this bit. Take these out and force legato, those. Great, so back to the stave. Looks a lot tidier, fitting onto one page, which is convenient, and the staves are nice and big so they can read them. So that would be good enough. So this is basically the composer's version. I can just title it. No prizes for guessing what the next day is going to be about. And that would be good enough. And then you could just sit there with the musician and, and just kind of workshop it, as they call it, which is to work out how it's phrased and how the dynamics are. Or indeed, we can go just a little bit deeper into how you can give them just a few more kind of heads up as to how to play this. So the first thing to do is just to give them a sense of how fast it is. So I'm just going to whack one of those in. An idea of speed is helpful for them. So microphones will be being set up, getting the headphone mix right, all of that kind of stuff. So to give them a, a, a kind of time, a speed, uh, is good because it means they can just kind of practice and get the muscle memory going 
whilst things are being set up. And then what we need to do is tell them how you want the basically the first bit played. So this we've called spiccato, which is just a kind of a light bouncing kind of short note. So there's actually a, a symbol for that. And I've set up a key command for this a little shortcut. So it's a little dot above the note. And what we can actually say is, well, that kind of suggests it's a short note. It's not joined up. They're not going to go da 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 da. They're going dum da dum da da. So there's a bit of daylight between between each of these notes and I want to specify that this is a spiccato so write that lowercase now you don't have to write this or indeed do the little symbols for each bar you can just do something called simil or similar or just sim for short and then they know basically until they receive another instruction that's how they're meant to play it this Now, the sample is playing in a kind of a way that I would describe as espressivo, expressively, and I want it to be more kind of uh, plaintive, reflective, uh, that kind of thing. So I'm going to basically say just that. I'm just going to go, I want it to be played plaintively. So I'll put that here plaintive but also the quality of the sound is it's very kind of a full sound that you can hear there and I want it to sound slightly more fragile so I'm going to do something where they actually move the bow so it's further up the fingerboard and this gives it a slightly more fragile more innocent sound so that's Saul Tasto. Now when it comes to these phrases there's really not that many of them. It seems quite daunting. You could just say plaintive and, and discuss with them, you know, that you want it sounding fragile and they'll probably do this thing called sultasto. But if you want to learn some of these very basic phrases, this will be the best purchase you've ever made. £6.95 and it has my name in, 1990. And look how well thumbed that is. That was the best £6.95 I've ever spent. I suspect it's probably more expensive these days. Orchestration by Walter Piston or this one that Paul introduced me to the study of orchestration like Samuel Adler. They both look really daunting, but they're just, they're almost like dictionaries for instruments. So you have your different instrument and literally within the first paragraph, it'll take you through how the thing is, you know, played and it's, you know, maximum ranges, all of that kind of stuff. But also, you know, these, these bowing techniques, spiccato, staccato, saltasto, all of that kind of stuff. Very, very easy books, great reference books to have. I've looked on the internet and it's not great for this kind of information so these still these paper websites if you will still do a better job okay so let's move along to the next section great so this next part i'm actually noticing that the cello is not really I don't know, it's kind of playing an accompaniment part and I want to make the most out of the cello part. So I'm going to have to do something that's a bit of a kind of a, an amalgam of parts. So let's just have a quick look here. I think we had, yeah. So this is what I want the cello to play. So I'm just going to copy that into the cello part. And again, at the end, I just want to check that we've got the cello kind of playing to the best of its ability. Okay, great. Happy with that. Right. So this next part, how's it going to play? Well, there's this technique or term called espressivo. Italian for expressive and you could just write expressive now it's not the kind of the climax of the piece so I'm, I want it just to be a little bit expressive so that's poco so poco espressivo again all in those books and uh, espressivo is you use that so often in orchestral music that they know that if you just do espra with a dot that's what it means and I'm going to say the same for the cello for that section
This next bit, we're going to go spiccato again. So again, those little dots. And then just go light spiccato. And the same here. And then sim, simile. And then we move to the climax at the end. And this is molto espressivo, very expressive. Right, what other pointers can we give them? Well, we've told them how roughly how fast it is. We've told them some playing styles we'd like them to adopt. How about kind of loudness? So we just need to put some kind of dynamics in. So this is very light. We put this beneath the staves and we've got forte, piano, pianist, lots of P's, very quiet, lots of F's, really loud. And this is kind of just, it's not super quiet, but just kind of quiet. So just going to do a little P there. And for this bit here, mezzo piano. So we're just going to, don't be put off by all these Italian things. It's just very, very, there's just not that many to learn. It kind of means medium quiet, just a little bit louder there. This is meant to speak out a little bit more. Starts off MF, but gradually at this point. So it's building, building, building to a kind of what we call forte and F. It's not super loud, but it is definitely, they're starting to really speak out here at this point. And we want to give a, a sense that we are building towards that. So I've got, again, a shortcut for crescendos, which is these lines, which kind of pointing them in the direction that we're going level-wise all the way to forte and the same for this bit. You can just draw these in. A lot of people just prefer to print out as, you know, without all of these markings and actually put these in, you know, with a with a pencil or something like that. That's absolutely fine as well. And again, just going back to my original point, you can just on the day get them to mark it out for you. But it's just, you know, if you want to save time, that kind of stuff, it's great to give them these pointers. Right, this is going to get quite crowded here. So we're back to our... There's some interesting sustain pedal stuff going on there. Right, so this I would say is uh, our kind of back to our medium. We don't want them to be playing this loudly. So it's going to look crowded on your score, but not on theirs, which is fine. There we go. So they know first note, they go back down to this kind of mezzo forte uh, level. And then let's go along to this bit here. So the geometry in my mind is this point should be a return to this level. And then we're going to build to an even louder climax but it's not just about how loudly they play we've said molto espressivo this will make it seem like it's louder because they'll be playing more passionately digging in more at the bow using more vibrato that kind of thing so let's go down to fortissimo here going to make it just even louder again do a nice crescendo which means gradually getting louder and then let's just look at this last bit at the end nice sustained pedal stuff going on there now this looks like an odd kind of rhythm so i'm just going to have a little look there and yeah what's happened is this has crept onto the previous beat and then also you know we want it to be back to that reflective kind of plaintive thing so let's do like i think back to piano quiet and again maybe that kind of saltasto sound Right, again, that's going to be great. They'd be very happy with that. You've given them some pointers of speed, playing style, 
and how quiet or loud. But there's just one last thing that we can do, which is phrasing. Now, with both woodwinds and with strings, you have to imagine there's, it's almost like there's two syllables. There's da, 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 which can be da, 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 or da, 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 da. But also, it can be da, ya, da, ya, da. Now, with woodwinds, basically what you do is you finger the different notes, but you don't tongue each different note. So can you imagine going, to, 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 to. That's tonguing every note which is basically if they were to see that they would pretty much tongue each note whereas I'd want them to go to to yo to to and the same happens with strings basically what they do is they change the notes with their left hand and they bow with their right and with this bit here what they would do is go da 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 now what you can do is very easy you can sit there and go can we phrase that any differently or you can have a go here and it's very very simple so what i want them to do is go da, ya, da, da, da. pitch perfect me so we introduce a thing called a slur and that's just basically a curvy line so they'll now know da, ya, da, da. and again let's have a look at this part Da, da, ya. So I'm going to just highlight these two and then let's do this slur above there for the answering phrase in the cello. And again here, handy. And another two. And you'll see a pattern emerging here of each note played within a bar. And what you could say to them, if you were dictating to them how you wanted them to play it, is bow this section in twos. So they know that basically there's one bow for every two notes. And at the end, I want them to just really taper off, die off. So what I'm going to ask them to do is just at the very end is go dim which means diminuendo. We could have also done a little kind of one of these things going in the opposite direction. But this just means that just they taper it off at the very end. And that's basically it. So the next thing to do is to print and let's make a PDF out of that. Day four, composer. So that's your composer score. And then just double click, have a little look at that. Now, I just think it gets a little bit crowded and messy. You've got the whole page to work with. So I'm just gonna drag that out. That looks a little bit more attractive and first violin and if I, I don't know the name of the violinist but if I did know the name I, I would replace that for their actual name just makes it look friendlier when they get there on the day it's all about putting them at ease so you know this is not by any means a well laid out score it's still a little bit funky it orchestrators when they do it in Sibelius part of their job is to make it as clear and as easy to read for the violinist but this will be fine just working with one person they'll be able to kind of get their head around what you want them to play so let's do that save as PDF back on clicking there and then let's look at the cello and again let's just spread it nice and out so it's nice and tidy and then I'd basically probably send that to myself. And the last thing we want to do is, uh, whilst I could record the cellist and the violinist straight into this session, what I do like to do is prepare some uh, tracking stems, basically. I'm actually going to do this somewhere else, so it's kind of quite necessary to do that. They may not have, you know, taking MIDI and, and your samples and all of that kind of stuff is fraught with danger. And it's likely that they'll want to record it into Pro Tools anyway. So I'm just going to basically create some very basic stems that we can work with so that we can adjust the mix on the day to suit what they want to hear in their headphones but also what we're listening to so what I thought we'd do is first of all mute these off never want to hear them ever again and I'm going to basically do the strings in one pass and then the rest of mix as I call it in another pass but I'm also going to isolate the actual parts we're getting them to play so we can mix those slightly differently as well now if I recall correctly so let's just mute off those and solo that day for rest of strings and then I'm going to isolate 
the actual parts they're playing. I mean, that's the kind of rule for tracking stems is whatever you're tracking, make sure you've got a stem of that. So if I was going to have a woodwind stem and maybe get a cellist, the cellist may want to hear the woodwind before you record it. But then when the woodwind player comes in, they definitely don't want to play against their kind of sampled cousin. So you want to be able to mute it out. So let's unmute these, solo those, bounce, tracking strings. And we've got the rest of the mix here. Here we go, sell it that out. And that is R-O-M, which the engineers I've been working with for, I don't know, 15 odd years now, uh, know that that means rest of mix. So there we go there. Uh, the next thing to do is the musician will need a click. And if we're not working with Logic, uh, we need to get that click into Pro Tools. And the way you do that is by creating a MIDI file. So export all tracks as MIDI file, and they'll import those MIDI files into Pro Tools. And it'll challenge you to say, do you want to import the tempo map as well? And you say yes, and then you get rid of the MIDI files. So you save that. But also to be super careful, I'm just going to find an empty track, solo that, and I'm going to turn the click on. Crucial with clicks, not to have any emphasis on the one of the bar. The players, I don't know why, they just really hate it. They just want to, you know, you just say, listen, I'm going to count you in four, and then they know where the bar lines are. So they don't like the emphasis at all. So that's just, I'm going to bounce that as well. Now, what you can do is just do a little check here. So that all sounds fine to me. Uh, I'd probably zip it up as is and take my laptop and my samples with me. If there are any problems, I can re-output stuff. But if you just want to be sure, it's always good just to drag it into Logic and just check it through. Create new tracks. There we go. Let's just solo those. So turn to click back off and... And I've just spotted a bit of a boo-boo. We've got the music coming in on the one and there's no counting. So what I'm gonna need to do is re-output all of that with a two bar counting. So we do that by going like that, insert time like that. And what we'll have here is, yeah, that's all good. So let's have a listen to that. That's more like it. The, the situation, you know, now, had I gone to the studio and had that kind of faux pas that it started on the first beat and there was no counting, the studio would have fixed it and you might not have noticed it until you're actually sitting there with the player. There would have been just a little bit of flapping around and like, okay, so this is the imaginary two bars before bar one, all of that kind of stuff. And what it does is it just starts the session out with them maybe losing just that little bit of faith in you or you rather being a bit paranoid and losing faith in yourself. So I think it's always good to correct these, even if it is kind of boring and tiresome, just so that things seem as well prepared as, as you can humanly make them. So I'm just going to rebounce these um, tracking strings. The number of times I've done like track lays of loads of cues and they've all got clicks over them. So rest of strings and finally the click back on. Okay, and not forgetting the MIDI file as well. So export, put it all into the same folder there. Let's just isolate those and check them. Nice count in there. So the reason I give two bars is it gives one bar, it's just a good practice to get into, one bar for the conductor to hear and then a bar for the conductor to count them in. There's not going to be a conductor on the day, but as I say, it's just a good habit to get into. One day you will be scoring for a massive orchestra. So let's just isolate each one of these. So that's good. You can see it's got nothing else on it. So 
if you have the time, double, triple check, check against the score, try and follow it on the score. You know, I can't help you with the uh, amount of experience you have uh, in this respect or indeed the amount of theoretical knowledge. We're we're where we're at. Um, But what you can do is just be super prepared to create an environment and a session that runs as smoothly as humanly possible so that you can just be with the player getting the sound that you want out of them. And it's not about knowing all of the Italian phrases. It's just about working with them, just like you would a guitarist or a drummer, just need it to be a little bit louder there, a rim shot there, you know, that kind of stuff. It's it's no different from any other musician. So being prepared means that you're not worried about the technical aspects of what's going on and why the score is not in, you know, in sync with the, the sequence, all of that kind of stuff. Talking of which, and I just checked this before finishing up, there's something often I will do is actually just change the key of a cue uh, if I'm like cutting and pasting with this transpose function. Make sure that no tracks are transposed because what will happen is the notation will be in the wrong key, the wrong notes. So you need to do something which on Logic is called normalize MIDI. And there's three ways, certainly within Logic, of doing that. You can create a blank region, say there, and just merge it and it'll automatically normalize. Uh, You can find the normalize MIDI function. I have a hotkey, which is control N. Anyway, that's about it. So we've got our MIDI file there, uh, so we can create a tempo map. Uh, We've got our scores there, and we've got our stems, including a click that's already burnt in. You know, the studio you may be going to may not have that sound. They may have a little bleepy metronome, which uh, musicians hate. So I know I'm safe with a click that musicians can work to that's headphone friendly, all of that kind of stuff. Everything you need in the one file. I then zip that. Make sure you wait for the zip to complete. So easy to send incomplete zips. And then I've got a lovely tasty hotkey here to there and transfer it on we transfer so whatever happens you know i forget my hard drive i leave my laptop at home whatever it's on the cloud because whilst this is the easiest and most fun enjoyable part of composition it's often the most expensive <laughs>